Hello, Mark. Hello. Um, a very belated happy birthday. I... <laughs> happy birthday. Sorry? My birthday's in June. Oh, well, I've obviously had brain fart in my diary. <laughs> Not to worry then. <laughs> But thank you for the but thank you for the book. That was a very oh no. Well, I thought that might. I just thought that might uh, cheer people up a bit. Yeah. What did I think? Why I don't know. Going on with the sound here. I can't. Uh... Can't hear me. No, I I can. Uh, hang on, let me try. Okay. Now, can you say something? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Sorry, yeah, yeah. I, I can hear you. Yeah. Loud yeah, I have no idea. Well, I know idea why, uh, because if I look now in my diary, it should show your birthday in there somewhere. Because I know it's yeah. Oh, I have no idea. I must. I must have. I must have the other day. I must have auto scrolled my calendar without noticing. <laughs> no, it's because when I sent you the book, I thought, oh gosh, it's Fred's birthday the following weekend, and then I I duly forgot that fact, which was wrong anyway. Well, you were here a couple of years ago for the 50th. Yes, I was, yeah. And it was warm at the summer. So where is everybody today? Oh, here's Peter. There's Peter. Actually, it's quite funny, Var Mark Bernstein. I, I was thinking of you because I was reading a paper he just referenced to me. It's, and... In it, it says, it's autumn 1995, sitting in our living room, we connect our home computer to the relevant encyclopedi encyclopedic service and don a helmet and gloves. What are you looking at? Sorry? Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a paper called No Sphere by a guy called Douglas Lennart. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's well known. Hi, Peter. Yep. Good morning. How are you doing, guys? Hi. Oh, thanks. Yeah, good, good. Had an interesting week in Paris. I, I met with uh, a couple of people in the morning. One of them was uh, Paul Roney. He um, has a company called Cosmic, Cosmic App, uh, which is very interesting. It was one of those uh, put out on Twitter, I'm in Paris, who wants to have coffee? So that was nice. And I have to say, uh, London is a great uh, marketing um, situation for London. The uh, infrastructure is such a mess. Here in London, I don't know if you know, Peter, but if you want to use public transport, you just use your credit or debit card, tap in and out, whether you're taking a train or a bus or an underground, doesn't matter. In Paris. Oh, nice. When I was doing my mini pupillage back ages ago in law school, I had to get like a special dedicated pass. I had to be waving around. Yeah, no, you still have to do that in Paris. So we couldn't go somewhere because the tickets for that to go there you had to buy this other system and there weren't tickets and there weren't people and then there was obviously a strike we had two strikes so that's you know very parisian the air quality was horrendous and um of course the traffic was a jam but yeah no it was lovely on the monday well sorry we're only there monday friday on the tuesday valentine's day we went to the restaurant in uh emily in paris and had lunch so that was really cool. And, you know, sitting there having a not very impressive lunch, but lovely place and all these people doing selfies outside. And then Wednesday, we went all American and had uh, Paris Disney, which was very impressive. So, yeah, it was uh, it was a restorative week. Oh, yeah. Ah, thanks for the citation. You gave them the whole bib take. That's the way it should be done. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, that was that interesting thing I had after, well, both the lecture I gave to Dini's class and Mark's talk to, I can't remember, oh, to, you know, Tools for Thought um, podcast was, yeah, actually give them everything and, and let people consume it as they may. Um because, because otherwise we, we we keep we keep passing all this carefully curated knowledge through the appalling needle of some completely arbitrary print format that that then stuffs off important stuff you might need to go find it again. Hmm. The the reason um, Peter the, re the the reason this thing came up is is surface well something's been rumbling along for a bit in the tinderbox thing is that 
is sort of people asking, it's a classic thing. I can never work out whether it's tire kicking or people have a real point, but there's this sort of thing. So it would be really cool if we could. And it's this idea that I want to see the same thing portrayed a number of different ways, which is subtly different from different view specs in the sense that at one and the same time, they might want things to be in a different place and have a, a different visualization. Um, and it sort of tracks back to the problem about where you store that. So it's not that it can't be done, but doing it in a way that's probably usable by people who aren't by and large particularly technical uh, is mm -hmm. quite interesting. <laughs> Well, I've been on an odyssey of technology integration, trying to get the test bed in place for all the stuff that I really want to be building. And it turns out there are a whole bunch of different templates for creating electron desktop applications that also work with the Vite bundler and are also compatible with running Imba to generate the actual underlying JavaScript that's going to be running in the engine. So I've been doing that for the last couple of weeks, and it's actually at the point where I can generate a double clickable Mac application that's able this to thing accept. Is being recorded. Oh, hi, Fabian. Does he hear us? Hello, hello. I can hear you. Ah, sorry, it took a while to get back to you on that query. I recommend contacting Megan Ma at Codex, since she's a fellow there, and either she'd be able to give that talk you're interested in herself, or point you to someone who would. Super, thank you very much. I'll, I'll follow up on that. Okay, very good. Um, so like I was saying, I've been working for the past couple of weeks, getting it to the point now where I can generate a double clickable Macintosh application. It can accept drags of folders from the desktop. And when I drag the folder in, it's gonna automatically set up file watchers on the folder and subfolders. Oh, and it's gonna generate the generic project folder structure in that folder if it doesn't already exist. If it does exist, it won't do anything. Otherwise, it will automatically flush out template files to work with the system. And it's going to start up a file watcher. The file watcher will be watching a grammar file. If the grammar file changes, it will then regenerate a parser based on that grammar, then apply that parser to any files in the source directory to generate output in the destination directory and a documentation directory. Um, so once I have all the code semi-bulletproof, I'll make it available to the rest of you in case you want to play with it. Um, if you like, I can just give you a quick look at my VS Code desktop here, and you can see what the actual file looks like. Uh, let me share screen. If we could, let's see, what button is that? It's the big green one. Let's see. <clears throat> oh, wait, I've got to hang on. I've got to put the Zoom screen on the same screen as the program I want to show you first. And let me just do that. Otherwise, when I go to share screen, it'll be sharing the wrong desktop, and you won't actually see what I think you're looking at, which you won't be looking at. Ah, the fun of modern tech. It's fun of luckily of being lucky enough to have many screens. Okay, now. Well, you're getting that up. I just wanted to mention I've been really trying to work with the the pro headset. It, I find it very com comfortable, but for some reason, maybe it's my Wi-Fi. It's just not reliable to connect to my desktop, especially using Meta's own um, desktop sharing, which is nice and simple in principle. It just doesn't carry through. Mm. Very, very odd. I would have thought that would have been the single first thing that would get done. Uh, and also then you can have uh, multiple screens too. Peter, are you, have you managed just to Just about, just about. You're on a Mac, right? Yeah. You can just move your Zoom screen across to that screen. Okay, I think it should work now. Let's see. Well, let's see, Zoom.
did not like shrunk you down to a little pop-up window. That shouldn't be it. We'll get there. Just give me a second. Not seeing you yet. So, Fabian, one thing I found out on um, the trip to Paris, which was obviously lovely, is that uh, you're in Brussels, right? Are you there, Fabian? Yes, I was putting my thumb up. I'm in Brussels, yeah. So, ah, there you are. Moved it to the wrong desktop again. Now, I, I found I guess, just really quickly, Peter. I just want to say to Fabian, the Eurostar is absolutely ridiculously fantastic. Partly the thing about when you leave, you show your passport to the arriving country. So, when you're on the train, you arrive. It's like a normal destination, just there. So, um, I think we should do more things in your neck of the woods. Very happy to come to Brussels for a day trip. We should organize something whenever it suits you, if, if, if it suits you. Sure. Let's do it. Cool, cool. Okay, here we go. Okay. Can you see it? Can't see it. All right. Very good. Very, very good. All right. So this is a view of the overall project. Um, we have a build directory. This is where all of the assets are going to be going into the Mac app go. Don't have to pay any attention to that. The distribution directory is where all of the pre-compiled components of the application wind up landing. And actually, the main directories that we're working with, so all this stuff up to here, these two directories, the build and the disk, are basically tooling directories. The node modules directory has all of the underlying libraries that are being used by the project. And I have integrated in the Peggy parser, the Ramda functional programming library, a um, couple other useful tools like partial lenses. Uh, that's an optics library that allows you to maintain sorting and automatically generate um, missing path components if you're trying to basically self vivifying nested structures in JavaScript. Um, Those are very useful because basically it lets you impose constraints, uh, automatically capitalize or normalize cases, uh, sort things, and all that will happen behind the scenes. The idea of a lens is it's a bi-directional function that you can either read through or write to, and it will automatically create the path of the lens for you if it doesn't entirely exist. So you can basically ignore all of those little things, normally you'd have to have a lot of programming logic to make sure everything's there. And it just hides all of that complexity. And best of all, lenses can be composed. And they basically let you look at one subcomponent of a data structure without worrying about where it is in the overall data structure when you're working with it. Uh, the Ramda library has things like mappings so that you can automatically apply a function to a whole slew of data and different filtering algorithms and lots of useful utility there. So those are my real go-to tools that I use along with the PEG.js parser generator. Uh, so those are all the little sub-libraries. Uh, the first file is our package file. And this again lists all of the dependencies, development time and build time. Uh, one of the things I discovered the hard way was that I had to add a lot of the sub-dependencies of the primary libraries in his development dependencies. Otherwise, Electron wouldn't be able to find them when it was generating the Mac app based on the project, even though everything was working fine in VS Code, which I guess has a better and different algorithm for finding stuff and has a little bit more intelligence than the Electron bundler code does. And our basic scripts are pre-build, which runs all of the pre-processing code and sets it up so that the result could be served as a static website off of a local directory. Um, build Mac, which takes that local directory that's serving the generated application and turns it into a bona fide Macintosh application. Um, start, which runs the preview server on the output directory. And of course, dev, which will watch for any file changes to any of the subfiles, regenerate them and update the preview server on the fly. 
Uh, we have PNPM lock, which just sets which specific versions we knew were working so that we don't have to worry about an update causing something to break down the road. Electron Builder YAML, um, that's config file for the Mac App Builder system. Um, the Vite config file lets us plug in the YAML, uh, lets us plug in the input Peter, preprocessor. Yeah. Peter, what, what, what is it particularly that you think is exciting to show us? Because you're going through a lot of stuff that at least Mark and me really, <laughs> you might as well be talking Chinese. Gotcha. Okay, um, let me just run the thing. That's crazy. PNPM run dev. Okay, here's our little sample application here. Now the user interface is very simple. We just have a text field for the workspace. And let's say we wanna create a new workspace. Let's call it workspace eight. The second that we change that text field, it will cause the system to reactively regenerate an entirely new folder with a complete project waiting. And um, see if I can find that here on the desktop. Here we are. Project eight now exists. So it's created for us a transpiler directory with a startup grammar file in it, a test YAML file in it a source file that would be initial input for the transpiler, a documentation file, which would get to be LaTeX source code and would automatically be generated to produce the PDF documentation, and a destination for the output of the post-process file coming in. So all of that gets set up automatically. Then I'm plugging in now the code for the file watcher which will be looking at those files. If those files change, it will then rebuild the transpiler and apply it to the input or just rerun the transpiler if the grammar hasn't been updated and all that changed was the input file. Uh, the other thing that's interesting here is the YAML file. Let me show you that. That's off in the transpiler folder for the project. And the way this is going to work is we're going to have a set of, let's see, this is an old version of it. Um, here's what the data is gonna look like. It's gonna be a list of objects and the object will be a test name, which will be a name like say, um, empty file. Input, which of course in this case would be an empty string. So this is representing the equivalent of having an empty file being fed into the system and then expected, which will be the next field. And the expected in this case would be empty because of course there's nothing in it. Now, what we're gonna have in the system is a list of all of the test cases that we've defined. And I'll have a little user interface for you to add new test cases. Um, once you put those in, every change to the parser will trigger the parser to be run against each of those test cases. And if the input doesn't match the expected, if the output of the input doesn't match the expected output, then I'll have that little test block turn red to let you know that the test failed. So that's basically what the user interface will look like. Uh, maybe in another week, I'll have that code wired in. It took all this time just to get the tooling to the point that I could reliably build the double clickable Mac app and have the file watcher running inside the Mac app without throwing any security errors and automatically run the transpiler on it. So um, I'll give you an update next time we meet. And say, I guess I can stop sharing now. Uh, Peter, what's the, when you, yeah. when you, the, what you're referring to as the grammar, is that effectively something that defines uh, what you call things in your app? What, what sort of, in, in overview terms, what is what does the grammar represent? Okay, let me pop up the- page. Well, no, no, rather than show me the code, just, uh, I mean, just explain to me conceptually what what, what part of the okay, thing um, it is. Let's see, PegJS, PegJ, here we are. Okay, um, here's what the grammar would look like. It's a set of grammar rules that define 
how the parser is going to filter through the input and what data structure is going to be generated if it's able to match. Sure. So at a very high level, effectively, you'll get it's sort of it's a dictionary of things to uh, things to expect and what to do when you find them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. So this code here could be running inside of the app. And then if you change the input file, it would automatically generate the new result. Like here, this is a, say, a live version of the peg parser. If you change it to 12 on the fly, automatically the output updates. So with the test cases, if that generated output doesn't match the expected output, then we turn the test red and we flag it as a failed test. So that as I'm editing a grammar, and the editing of the grammar would be taking place inside of Visual Studio Code, not inside of my app. My app's just watching for any changes to the file. So I get all of the VS Code support for editing peg grammar files inside of VS Code. But as soon as I make the change, the system goes off and applies it to all the test cases, applies it to the sample code on the desktop, runs the other code. Uh, for instance, for the literate programming system, that additional code that's being run would be the LaTeX processor on the .tech file that's being generated in the doc directory to be able to produce the PDF documentation. So all that stuff is being handled by the testbed program while you're doing the editing of the source files and the other files inside of VS Code. So I'm not having to build an editor. This is just the program that's watching the file system, watching all the files and editing things. The other cool thing is that when we drag another folder in, let's say we had our workspace three over here, to change workspaces, you'd simply drag it in here, boom, it's changed to workspace three, and that would cause it to reinitialize the file watcher, stop watching everything from the previous workspace that we were using, start watching all the folders in the new workspace. So you'd be able to have as many of these projects using the little grammar parsers as you want running side by side and just drag them in or manually change the name if you're creating a new one. And of course, it'd probably take three hours to walk you through the Imba code, which you probably wouldn't be interested in. Oh, well, but I'll make the code oh, available if anybody wants to poke around at it. Interesting or able to understand. So that's another issue. But just wanted to say to the two Americans in the room, you must be immensely proud today of Biden walking around in uh, Kiev. That's just absolutely insane how that happened. We just saw it on the news here uh, not so long ago. So there is hope for the world. So that's good. As long as yeah. the balloons don't get us first. What's that? As long as the balloons don't get us first. Yeah, the balloons, exactly, yes. That was scary because that thing was big enough that it could have had an EMP weapon on it that could have killed the entire North American power grid. Yeah, well, that keeps breaking down all the time anyway, so. I, I, I love so that's what I've been that. working on last couple of weeks. And it's been, you know, a nightmare of build errors and integration problems because I have so many different sample boilerplates that I'm trying to merge together, but it seems to be working nicely now. And any changes to the source code cause that little demo app I was showing you to update on the fly. So it'll just automatically rebuild and run the modified code. Uh, the only thing that has to be built out as a full-fledged Mac app at this point is the file watcher component, which apparently won't run under the development mode preview, since it's still running inside a VS code as opposed to running in a separate program. But the final generated Mac app is also able to detect the file changes. The test version on the fly doesn't seem to pick up those events. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get that work. I might be able to call the file watcher code at a different spot within that whole mess and get it to work, but it really doesn't matter as long as I know that once the final file is built, it's going to see those changes. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah. we can do anything with that, um, like recognizing visual meta inside of source files and doing interesting things with it. So this test bed just alleviates a lot of custom tooling of building one-off projects as opposed to having this nice generic framework of a meta project that we can do anything that involves looking at a source code file of text, doing something with it, and generating some sort of result. 
Yeah, very cool. Um, Fabian Brandel, how are you? Uh, I'm great. Uh, I've been, uh, we had the uh, World Wide Web Consortium Standards Body uh, meeting for Web GPU last week. Uh, and that was uh, amusing, if slightly acrimonious at times. Okay. Um, uh, Google is very eager to get its implementation out, uh, but uh, given that there has not been a, given that it's supposed to be a standard, um, we do need to agree on aspects of it, and uh, they feel like it that their implementation is too far along for it to be to be bothered by by any meddling with what a standard needs to entail, um, failing to recognize that perhaps. It requires an implementation to really determine, like a, 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 a trial implementation to determine the appropriateness of a standard. Uh, so uh, I only popped my head in for a couple of the bits related to things like uh, VR, but uh, it was it was very amusing to hear that disconnect. Also, um, as with um, the same with web VR, um, nary a person involved in the deliberations or discussions really has the ability to apply any of these technologies to anything particularly um, pretty, let alone thoughtful or, or, or sort of enduringly valuable. And, uh, and I just I was reminded about how, how much of a sorry state of affairs that is that on all parts, like all parties send people who are responsible for implementing, but no, none of those implementing parties are particularly concerned with understanding how to wield those things like truly constructively. So yeah, it was it was a neat um, uh, peek back under the belly of the beast. I guess Google is a little sore now with all this AI stuff and their AI not being uh, the hero. So maybe they need a win. Yeah. They? There, I mean, I think the, the the mood in Silicon Valley has definitely changed as a consequence of the literal tens upon tens of thousands of layoffs, certainly. Um, and the the sense in which some of these things need to be contributive to to something constructive at some point, um, while uh, I'm not not an, I'm not an exceptionally well uh, exercised muscle is 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 the feeling that the need to to get a bit of a workout. Hmm. There was an interesting uh, YouTube on VR in Japan. I don't know if you've seen a thrill seeker is the name of the guy or the channel. And they're doing a ton of things. It's mostly games, of course, but also hardware, you know, small headsets dedicated to this, that. But there was one thing that kind of stuck out, and that was manga, as in, you know, cartoons in VR. That, that was a bit refreshing in a different uh, perspective than what we are used to here. So, um, yeah, that, that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think... Uh... One of the things that Gabe Newell said many years ago, uh, the guy who started, um, or if not started, then he's in charge of um, Valve Software, the company that makes Steam and Half-Life and stuff. Um, uh, he was uh, early, an early um, leader in all of the VR technology. He said that the first generation, which you know we're well past now, um, was of, of VR technology was based on the realization you could strap a phone to your face and all of the related technologies would be basically just all of the phone things. And if you uh, have the wherewithal to look at the lowest level of information about an Oculus Quest, even a Meta Quest 2 um, is still a pixel, a pixel phone in almost mm -hmm. every meaningful way. And uh, uh, as much as it was appropriate for it, the, the reality was that all of that was almost entirely still that phone technology. I didn't throw my lip left. Um, and, uh, and it took a, a number of years for people to realize that they could start building this book technology for those um, virtual reality things. The, sort of the, the fortunes of people who tried to pursue that have um, not been exactly steady. But uh, what it does mean now is that there has been enough of an impetus for people to pursue phone technologies, I'm uh, sorry, VR technology, so that people have been able to really shrink things down. So for example, that big screen VR a headset, tiny, you know, 189 grams, really small, two and a half kpi. Um, are there are not only are they do they exist, but they're in reach of people to kind of conceive of to build stuff. Granted, it's going to be a 
thousand dollar device, I think. But uh, but that 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 I think is really meaningful insofar as uh, people have the ability to imagine with components because hardware engineers have had the time to actually build hardware components that are truly appropriate to the demands and and the and and the domain of uh, of of VR stuff. So that's really exciting. Um, Talking of hardware, um, bef and before I say hello to you, Alan, uh, has any of you tried the PSVR two yet? It's interesting what people are saying about it. One of the key things is it has a cable. I'm not going to spend the money because it's purely for gaming. So although it will be fun, it, you know, it would be a luxury, but so you haven't tried it either. The, the one thing I hear is the graphics are amazing, but there is a bit of a screen door effect, which of course means that uh, text will then suffer immensely. I think the uh, Quest Pro is worse than the Quest 2 because of the screen door. Do you agree, Fabian? You have both as well, right? Yes, but yeah, to, to me, <laughs> it's uh, if I could have all the headsets, I would be marginally happier. But I really, again, it's um, riding that wave of hardware progress without caring much for it, delegating that to people who know it better than I do. So um, I, I don't mind. Like I, I wish I could play with them, but it's it's going to it's going to be better next time, marginally. So to me, everything is already here. <laughs> that's that's the key part, let's say, uh, and and building on it is more important. But uh, I wish I had the um, the big screen one. I admit, uh, mostly for the weight, um, <clears throat> the resolution. Um, and yes, yes, you need a cable, but that's everything is made for it. Let's say uh, you're not you're not supposed to not have a cable when it's that small and light. Uh, of course, none of us wants a cable. Everything should last infinitely and have highest resolution and all. But in practice, physics says no. I don't so, really um, mind the cable. I think that at least eighty percent of knowledge work with VR headset will be sitting down or standing up at a desk. But, but yeah, uh, you know, I was in, in Paris last week, which was which was nice. And Alan, I met uh, Paul Roney, Cosmic App. And so we had a nice, um, what is it, a brasserie or whatever, uh, coffee shop morning sitting there gossiping about you. So that was fun. Delightful. Delightful. <laughs> um, well, that's great. Yeah, Paul's great. And uh the hyper talk community is one that I know brought up before, but I, I feel like it it is very much the future of text group. So, and the tools for thought rocks and stuff like that. So any kind of overlap, I think could be serendipitous, you know, in the yeah. form of other media, uh, podcasts, newsletters, whatever, I mean, you know, just the goals, right? Um, which I'm interested in what what the focus of future of text for this year is if it's carrying on in the VR or uh, you know has the world turned upside down. Oh, the, uh, Hamilton quote, very yes. good. Um, that's funny. We saw a TV show yesterday that started with a Hamilton quote. Someone said, "Not yet," and my friends got so pissed off with me for pausing to point that out because it's anyway. Um, no, th this year, and it really depends what you guys think, um, my feeling is that we should move a little bit towards education, partly because, as I mentioned to some of you, I need to sell my software. So it helps me with my networking, to be very clear. Um, but also, I believe that um, reading and writing is a student-teacher thing all the time anyway. Anybody who's reading should think like a student. Anyone who's writing should try to be a you know, impressing their teacher. So I think it's a good model. I absolutely think that uh, VR will be a part of it. And my way of thinking now is that, you know, jumping, let's say five years ahead, VR will be how we will work most of the time. To me, that is obvious. That doesn't mean the other media are not useful at all. You know, it should be able to move around. So I, I think that just like we had the term horseless carriage when cars came around, you know, in a sense, VR isn't going to be that exciting by itself. Uh, I met with um, someone who used to work for the French uh, Ministry of Defense doing intelligence and knowledge work. 
uh, we had a wonderful morning. We've known each other off and on um, for years, and he's never really managed to fit in the future of text community. But um, it, we then came on to the discussion of uh, VR and AR and, and all that stuff. And it was really interesting and worthwhile to us. Two things. Number one, he kept referring it to heads. He said headset rather than VR, XR, which I completely agree. That's going to be the term. You know, people will think of the, the device. They're not going to think of the use case. So that was interesting. Second thing was he hadn't used VR since the 90s. And because of his position in the MOD, what he used then was phenomenally advanced. And it took him a while when I explained that, you know, you use your hands now. He was talking about the data glove and all these things. It's like, really, you can actually use your hands? You know, and then a few other things. So the work that he's doing now, now that he's left the MOD, is related to what we're doing. So just to have this really wise guy who's completely out of the picture be talked into the reality of what's happening now was quite fascinating and educational. But Alan, where do you think the community should go? Um, hang on, that's a paused question. Because um, I also need to emphasize that, as you all know, I had a stroke. So I'm being a little careful with stress and things like that like uh, transcribing our monthly discussions, I'll probably have to outsource that again because it's just fucking boring. Um, you know, I have problems concentrating for long periods of time like we all do if it's boring, even if it's great stuff. Um, so uh, in terms of, yes, I still want to do the journal, absolutely the book, absolutely the symposium. And I think Mondays with you guys is absolutely amazing. But it's, you know, I have to look at how much effort is put into the behind the scenes stuff. So yeah, Alan. How do you see the future of? Yeah, okay. Um, well, hey, everybody, it's been a bit. Um, the, uh, uh, the first thing I'd like to share for a moment uh, goes into VR and some sort of like what's exciting to me about VR. Um, if I could just share my screen for just a sec, um, then it, promise it won't take very long uh and I'll, I'll throw the link i'll throw the link in actually right now um this is a great uh site i stumbled on yesterday threw it into hyper talk um and on the surface it's just uh different visualizations of the periodic table of elements and you can see here someone's working in 4d um and even thinking of it as a physical object wrapping back around a spine um and it it kind of made me wonder you know like sometimes there are these uh there are these patterns we find that are like uh simple enough problems that that invite different interpretations and that seems to be what's going on with this site uh various kinds of uh interpretations periodic table i love it um I'm going to hit this one and uh did I get that right no. so then there's another one that's like in 4d um that would be if i can find it quickly otherwise i have it downloaded no rush uh i'll i'll throw it into the um into the chat the the image but that kind of stuff makes me really excited about where VR can come into play and and with education, right? You know, th this uh, uh, exploring, playing around, creating better visualizations. I don't even know that we'll be able to figure it out ahead of time. It's it's almost just has to be a uh, tangible, workable. Um, outside of the headset and and VR, um, I think where my head's at personally with everything going on with chat GPT, everything going on with sort of what feels like a, a um, uh, sea change in tech. Uh, I've started to focus on what I consider like really small designs, you know, like paperclip designs. And to my mind, that is very much in line with the future of text. I'll give you an example, task management tools, rely on they are they are scaffolded by or whatever uh this this idea of a, a to-do item having a checkbox right and that's task management that's the heart of it 
And uh, I know when I use those to do's for work related things, I hardly ever check off those boxes because the kinds of things that I create as to do's are not actually closed ended or, or one off. And so it, uh, I realized this last week, it, it's, it's one of those weird cases where an engineering mindset has creeped into what are kind of very fluid human problems. Um, and, and so the checkbox is great for a lot of to-dos, but considering its initial design was for answering a survey or an application on a, on a form, and now it's being used as you know, write down the thing and tell me whether you did it or not. It's a bit like using a paperclip to hold up your clothing and on a on a on a laundry line. Um, so, and it, but it has the benefit of being a very small thing. So it's a, it's a bit of UI that's been around since the beginning of time, and we haven't questioned it. Uh, if there could be a better kind of to do checkbox that was more appropriate to uh, that, that solve the actual problem, which for me is more like just checking in and, and, and maybe making progress and completing if I want to complete it, but not having to complete it, but still being able to say I did something to it. Then, um, you know, what else is out there that could actually be updated to our current way of using these 2D screens? So um, that's personally where I'd love to see conversations about the future of text go would be that sort of uh, one example is, you know, what would a task management language look like? You know, a, a, a supplemental language in the way that like emoji or supplemental languages. I can go on that forever. Uh, Fabian, I, oh, you just walked away. I saw the hand up. <laughs> so I was about to hand it over to you. Um, it's unrelated. So rather first, if somebody has any remote questions on, on this. I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. Um, they, yeah, Alan, this is very, very interesting. I wish you could put this in article form, obviously. Um, that's one thing. Uh, secondly, your, we, I, we, Paul and I, when we were gossiping about you, we're talking about your brain and your way of thinking. You're very good at rounding corners, not cutting corners, rounding corners, I think. Like you're looking at a thing that exists and instead of throwing it away, you're wondering if it can be modified to better fit what we do. That's a very interesting way of thinking. Uh, so I think we should really come back to this Thanks. much more today and dwell on that. It relates very slightly on a question I've been having lately of where to put an insight. For instance, we read something in a book. It's interesting in itself. It also relates to something else in our lives. Where the hell do we put it? You know, that's what almost all knowledge management things. Absolutely. About, except it isn't a box, just like your tick box. Right? How do we put it in in a fluid and connected way? And sorry, there was in this book, Connectome, you should all read it. It's wonderful. Something really, really pertinent. Oh, you have it. Wonderful. Uh, the Golgi, wonderful. The Golgi stain. Uh, that was used to uh, stain early cells so that we could view them. Um, something we've all learned in school. But did you know that one of the key things about that stain, it only stained a few cells, not all of them. So that is how we could actually see what was going on because it was too much. It was going to see everything. He likens the example of you have a bowl of spaghetti and you don't have the resolution to pick out the individual pieces of spaghetti. So if you can stain one piece of spaghetti black, even though it's all curly-whirly, even if it's a blurry view, you can then see it, right? So it's such an interesting insight from history. And I think it works in our field with exactly what Alan is talking about. Getting too much isn't useful. Getting it hard isn't useful. Being able to look at it in different degrees is just such a powerful thing. So it was really... Lovely to hear that. Um, I have yeah. many things, but I will pause because that was relatively related. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, Fabian, please, please go ahead. But we will come back to this. I am pretty, I'm very sure. I have, let's say, five completely different things. Um, so yeah, just stop me whenever. Um, the weirdest, I would argue, uh, and 
not really related to VR, but kind of, as I bought more gadgets because I can't stop myself. Uh, as some of you might know, I'm not a musician, but I, I like to press on keys uh, and a little uh, special thing about this one. Uh, you can hear it and it's not plugged to anything, so it works on battery. But it's also a MIDI keyboard, so if I plug it on the computer, uh, I can get either sound or, let's say, a signal or a, a note. Uh, but the problem is, I'm not a musician. I kind of was when I was a kid. Uh, I did sing and play flute in an orchestra, but I, I well, I didn't forget everything, but most of it. And I never played piano. Uh, but I don't want to be too bad. And I found this thing called chromatone. And basically the idea is that you associate a color with a note. Uh, and uh, it's actually really interesting that they um, started to explain a bit the how and the why. So there is a, quite a bit of explanation that people might enjoy or agree with and completely not also. Um, but basically, it's a mapping between color and sound. Uh, how justified it is up to us. But I think this way uh, to hijack something we know or something we're all familiar, well, most of us are familiar with, even without the ability to read yet, so including kids, um, so namely bright colors, um, is really interesting. And I think uh, being able to literally play with it as a way to learn a topic, any topic, could be music, but something else. So basically generalizing the idea, not, for, not of synesthesia, where you basically mix up on purpose or not a sense, for example, seeing color with hearing notes, um, but tries, uh, rather idesthesia, where you have a concept or a set of concept and you map them, for example, to colors. Um, I, I tend to think it might be a bit deeper than just a, practical tool to learn but can probably be applied to any learning topics uh, and i thought about it because to link back to vr i did a presentation two weekends ago uh, it didn't go well that was a pretty bad presentation i had too many things to show um, and i was too excited but that's okay um, but the the person i i spoke with after who gave a talk on the visualization of code repositories in vr um, also is a um, postdoctoral fellow in uh, Madrid, I think. And he made a, a tool to program in VR, you know, in web VR in a frame, and not using text. So only using symbols, let's say a variable is going to be a bird or an apple or a set of different fruits. And the idea is trying not to use text at all, which to me sounds impossible, but by or by default, if it sounds impossible, it should be interesting. Uh, but then the same thing might apply. Can you use, let's say, a set of fruits as an array? Uh, do you want to use the fruits and vegetables uh, and other uh, comestible food as a tree because there is a hierarchy behind it? So all that, I think, is uh, a pretty powerful thing. Um, and to be very practical, what I did, uh, I don't know if I have a, a link there. Uh, yeah, the, I'll just share the very last one. It doesn't have to be VR related, um, but I'll share my entire screen. Uh, I imagine you can see it now. And when I press on the key, I get the sound. I get the surface, the score, uh, and the colors matching it. And the idea is you don't need to be able to read surface uh, to learn music. Uh, and that you start to bind, basically, uh, the notation system, which is one among many, with, let's say, uh, an output or an action, which is creating a sound. Um, so that that's the kind of thing I've been doing for the last couple of uh, days. And uh, and it works in the headset. So when I press a key in the headset, because I can plug it with a USB, when I press, I have a little note going out. It's more or less calibrated, but you see a little block and then you can grab it 
uh, or you can pitch it with the other hand and replay the notes that you've been playing before. So it starts to be a blend between a real instrument and a non-physical instrument. Love it. That is very interesting. Uh, I'm going to give yeah, you. That... Sorry. I was just going to say that the the uh, creation of the mapping between the color and the and the notes is useful. I mean, musical notation provides a sort of a a, a long run spatial and like visual spatial kind of representations of things so that you have things to look at, look forward to in time, or look ahead at for what's going to happen. But I feel like adding color to it like that helps a lot. Um, and uh, being able to add structure around conceptual things is uh, something else that I was playing with and I can talk about in a bit as well. Just, just as a, a bizarre layer on this, I, I put a YouTube video on the chat that, trust me, is, is related. It seems not. Um, if you can just listen to the first 20 seconds uh, with sound, it's the sound, it's it's the word uwu. Okay. Once you've heard that, you can pause and I'll tell you why. Look at Mark's face. So I'm trying to get me so nervous at the moment. Okay. Are you familiar with this video, anyone? Yeah. Uh, no. Oh, Fabian, no. you are. Okay. So, so the thing is, uh, it, because Fabian was talking about uh, sounds and controls and kind of opposite of text. So I, I find this so incredibly fascinating because she says a word uwu in a very japanese anime style even though she's not that and it is something that absolutely cannot be captured in text it has no semantic meaning it is a little bit um, cute it has got all these things and emily and i've been trying to understand it so in terms of uh, going in the opposite direction we, we, you know even though we are the future tech community there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, continuing uh, deep discussions of what you're talking about, um, Fabian, because th th that video, that sound is just so freaking weird. <laughs> it's just, I'm, I'm glad I had an excuse to show it to you. Um, and and it, it, it does also go to, to Alan's, uh, Alan's button, I mean, what what is one of the key things about text? It is black and white, normally. It is very hard edged. It, it is mm -hmm. linear. It has all these great attributes, but like you well know what Harari said in Sapiens, it was invented to solve a different problem from speech. And I think now we're at a stage where both obviously XR, but also with things like tap back and emojis, we need to look at polishing those edges. You know, that, that to do button check mark, I think, is both a very interesting specific case and also kind of a, an analogy for a lot of other things. I think, Fabian, you, you were not on a tangent. I, I think it was very related what you showed. It's, it's interesting. It's, uh, th this book um, took out for $2 at Thrift Books. Um, it covers a lot of the, the themes of the day, which is essentially... <laughs> Oh, for God's sake, another book. Okay, fine. Yes. Uh, how how the the engineering mindset took over, and so that that really scratches my itch of how you know we we tend to fall into an engineering way of solving problems, which makes sense because you have to break problems down into their atomic components if you're going to make any kind of progress. You can't be holistic about everything. So that's great, but then we kind of get caught in that that feedback loop. On the other side, with the you 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 know the term. Uh, and the, and the music. There's um, there's the book you were talking about earlier last year, language and reality, which I really think is it's important to remember that that claim of um, language is being used for coordination points because I think that really uh, applies to UI as well. That none of these things have to be solved exactly. There are going to be words that that just don't make it into text. 
you know, the text is a is actually a pretty thin representation of reality, right? So we just get by with something that's close enough that a consensus of, of people can say, oh yeah, I, I get, I agree that this will equal that for the time being. And, and that's how I look at even the to-dos for tasks, right? There is probably no perfect solution for um, the, the open game of uh, the thing that I have to do. So it could be that the checkbox is satisficing, you know, for now. Um, but but it's kind of just, I think, good to to examine and also to keep in mind the language spoken or written uh, still cuts a lot out, right? It's pretty obvious stuff, but. The main takeaway I get from that is the whole coordination purposes. Like the brain was invented for movement, basically, language is to coordinate, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, the, that, that book, who, who is the author? I'm on the Amazons, and it seems like separate. Uh, Three authors. The first one to look for is Rob Reich. Uh, there we go. Good. Thank you. Um, Do you people don't use uh, uh, OCR when somebody shows a book? A what? What's that? <laughs> when when somebody shows uh, something with text, especially something that has been typed, um, I suggest using OCR, not like retyping. And then most likely you're going to get a hit, especially if it's like rarely uh, together put together words. Um, so something yeah unique enough. So the, you should have a shortcut for this, especially during presentation. That's pretty useful. Well, Bien, if I it's five p.m. If I read a paper book and I do some underlining, take a picture with my iPhone, I can then take in in photos on the Mac. Just select that text, and then I can paste it into author as a citation. Author will find the book and make a citation out of it for exactly the reason you said. It's it's a really cool structure. Hmm? And and on this. Uh, you cut out too early. What was that? On desktop, like right now, if I show you um, this, let's say, are you going to type it? Will you have a solution to extract it without typing it? Uh, hang on. Oh, okay. oh I, I could take a screenshot, and then from the screenshots, uh, I, I can select. Yeah. It. Yeah, you have the ability on macOS from a screenshot to select the text. So I, there it is. And then one of the, yeah, one of the cool things is that that text I think then becomes indexed against that that image, and so you can search for the textual content of that image, and it will come up. Although I think perhaps it that only happens if you select the text at this point. It's one of those places where the text doesn't actually exist until you um, until you. Just the anecdote. I, but, I insisted heavily on this in the sense that uh, I think I mean we're old old people here. But uh, I, there is an especially an even older person that I helped this weekend. I saw my father, and he has a, an icon, and he did not know about the OCR uh, on the default uh, camera. Uh, and I, I was just like here insisting a bit in the sense that we also all fantasize about XR this, AI this, whatever that. And we have already a pretty amazing tool all around us already in our operating system we just don't get in the habits of using them except sorry if i was insistent that, that's interesting because when we were in france and all due respect fabian i do love you i'll give you a cuddle when i see you but extremely backwards country tech, digitally um because for, for instance i've noticed people who don't use an iphone if there's a QR code, you have to open a special app to scan the QR code. You can't just use the normal camera, at least on the phones we saw with people who had to do it. Um, and also it, it, to see where we are today, like buying tickets for the uh, Metro in Paris it is an adventure in paper and, and so on. So it, it, just in different realms, how where we are is really fascinating. I know you cannot punch through the screen. Zoom doesn't work like that. 
that there are, there are a lot of things that are available that are, just aren't used. For, uh, for, for the old folks, myself included, and this is not another uh, book to pick up. Uh, this is just a story. Um, one of the true treasures, I've been buying a lot of uh, physical books from, from uh, thrift books when they come up cheap, uh, just because. I win the old folks one. I got nice, patterns. nice. That's great. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the treats of of getting these used books, which I'm I'm, I think in part reading now, just because I'm I I don't even feel like I can trust Amazon, so I, I'm I'm kind of veering a little bit away from the ebooks. But anyway, I got this book, which I've already read in ebook form, but it, it was cheap, and I was like, oh, I'm going to grab it. And then I uh, I open up the back. And I see these written words, which say, not mentioned, two of my famous bosses, Richard Hamming, inventor of the Hamming error correcting codes, Herman Gummel, known for the Gummel number, et cetera. And then, so I'm like, oh, that's that's curious. And then sure enough, on the front page, uh, the guy puts his name, D.G. Schweikert, Bell Labs, 1966-1980. Wow. So it's like, I thought I was just buying a book, but I bought like. It's a history. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Anyway, just wanted to share that with you all. So uh, I do want to ask, you know, we, we, all, we always try every once in a while to just check in the time there to be logical and then loosen, not logical, planned and then loosen our discussions. But I really want to ask you, the stuff what Alan said about checkboxes, right? As an example, where the hell do we put it, right? Can I, I talked a little bit with um, with Paul in in Paris about where do you put thoughts and stuff? And, you know, he would plug, put it in Cosmic. That's his app. I'd want to put it as a defined thing in Author. I know that's limited, but is there more open? You know, we have BibTech for sharing citations. Is there a way we can? that is easy and natural to create the thoughts that Alan shared with us, unless he does something with it, is lost. You know, we have this recording and, you know, maybe it'll be transcribed automatically, but how are people going to find it? How are we going to refer to it? Doesn't this seem to be one of the prime knowledge management issues of our age? Well, yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, in, in the case of the, the task management, yes, I, I am. Uh, that's part of a series of things that I'm working on. So I just sent you a link of of the work in progress that I posted online, but is not ready for publication. Um, but so so sidestepping that to the point that you made about insights, right? I think that there's something um, th that is the important part, and and I, I do think that there is a a, a missing UI affordance and a, a, and several others that are missing that fall under a kind of personal knowledge management slash task management language, which is uh, the, the same as using non-printable characters, but to, to sort of do things, right? So something could be structurally within a line, within an outline or DOM layer, but if you can visually push it off to the side, right? And say, I don't want this to be underneath that, even though uh, for record's sake, it could be, but I feel like it's an aside. I feel like it's a, a separate thing. Uh, I think there's a lot in the, just in the world of 2D UI that uh, has yet to be explored. But I, I'll, I just realized I jumped ahead in line. Pardon. No, no, no. I was relevant since we started off you, but uh, Mr. Anderson. No, I was really interested by the observation earlier about the checkbox because I, I, I couldn't agree more because often um, in terms of what I'm recording is almost so I it's almost a, a bit more of this a bit less of that you know so my current state is there are all these things contingent on what I'm doing but the focus needs to be you know more blue and less green no it's very abstract um and I was reflecting actually just this week um again because it uh, it always hits up on me in the tinderbox community but um basically being hammered on by a couple of people who it's a classic case you know to the person with a hammer everything is a nail and this is someone who'd been using a wiki based markdown editor and could not understand informational linkage in any other form 
I mean, having really, it took me a while to realize that the problem was that they were so stuck inside this metaphor. And I, and I, I find myself wondering just how much damage, in a way, has been done by the, the very rapid sort of me too of lots of markdown slash wiki tools, which isn't to be unkind about them at all. But they're actually quite infantilizing in terms of um, they cram you into a very narrow perspective, which certainly suits someone who's uh, likes singing in very hard edge boxes and likes outlines and things like that. But in terms of the the looseness and the flexibility of um, knowledge, which is what you were alluding to, and you you know you mentioned, well, why does it have to have a check box on it? I think it's 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 tremendously destructive. Fabian, go for it. So my little intuition is it has to go somewhere. The worst place where any kind of thought might go is the better place, and then it never ends up there. And then you potentially lose the idea, no matter how bad it is. And then you recess over and over. Uh, so to me, the my, my personal perspective on, on this is uh, never trying to do better, just doing it and eventually improving it. And a little example on, on how I did this recently, to share again very quickly, I started to work on a robotic arm, uh, did not kind of half broke it, so I had to fix it, but I managed to make it, to make it move. I didn't want to hurt any of my colleagues. Uh, I showed this because it's made in China. Uh, it's I'm the problem, not the robot, not the software. But the software came into a virtual in a, in a machine where I usually would, uh, in order to send it stuff, I would normally put um, Telegram. Like I have, a, I send myself messages through Telegram when I have an idea, like a password. You, uh, what do you say? Like a key for an API, something like this. And then I usually log in on the other machine and then copy paste there. And I thought that's usually fine, but then you get a machine I don't trust. Um, that's not okay. So I basically added a little uh, clipboard on my wiki. Uh, and then I added lots of little functions uh, using JavaScript, using curl, using whatever. Uh, and I did not I have a couple of ideas on how to bring it to VR, bring it to um, text message, like any kind of way to input uh, basically text in it. So yeah, basically to, to have a, a clipboard across devices, including the ones you don't trust, or you don't have like a convenient way to, to uh, log in uh, in a safe way. So yeah, my, my heuristic there is dump it somewhere, place it somewhere better uh, after. Yeah, Brandel, but I just want to interject a brief thing in addition to what you said there, Fabian. Also, it takes more energy to organize information than to create information, right? So dumping somewhere, good, but having the ability to organize it, difficult, no? Sure, but it, it's again a um, second step, because otherwise it's again like having to refresh so that you don't lose the idea. But yeah, it, it's going to be, uh, it's usually there in the dump pile, because, for example, I don't have on the moment the immediate place to put it in. So it's it's not good, but it's better than not doing it. So ideally, there is the perfect place and it's easy to reach. But it's as we all know, it's not always the case. Uh, good point. Yeah, sorry. Uh, please, Brandel. Um, I, uh, I'm a strong believer in uh, a lack of formalism, uh, in the lack of uh, nailing those things down. So uh, two things, I have a pretty good memory. I can remember things relatively well for being able to kind of dredge up and bring into conversation. Um, but the other thing that I do a lot is I leave things in other people's heads. So I talk about things and I repeat and I rehash the same idea over and over, um, but that changes a little bit as a consequence of the telling and the consequence of all of the different things that I do with it. Um, when I program, uh, I often try to program very small, very throwawayable things for the benefit of being able to 
actually rebuild and reproduce things uh, with the small changes and nuances that have entered into my perspective. Because when you have a, a larger totalized informal system that you apply to everything, then it has a tendency kind of like Mark alluded to, to uh, calcify the, the nature of the dynamics that it captures. You have to fit things that have increasingly less or decreasing relevance to the specific boxes and fields to those same boxes and fields. And, uh, and so um, if you are willing to and committed to throwing stuff away and losing things and forgetting things, then um, keeping it as amorphous and rough as uh, the systems you have uh, permit um, and even risking a little bit of forgetting at times, uh, it can actually be really good for the fluidity of the representations because you can realize things and you're not <laughs> stuck with a, a previous um, iteration of the way that you thought of those things. Um, and, uh, and it's, yeah, it's why I, I, I enjoy and, uh, and uh, am relieved at the utility of the messiness that I seem to uh, only <laughs> have the ability to produce. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wholehearted agreement. The, the, the checkbox question is almost a, almost like a, a useful as a thought experiment and perhaps only useful as a thought experiment because the tendency is to come up with a more robust solution which is more formal and it actually flies in the face of, of the, the very reason that a checkbox is useful is that it's a typographic element that says this is different than descriptive text this is what follows here is text you should take some action on right and it's it's kind it's a great small design it's like a paper clip you know uh and and so i totally agree uh with avoiding formalisms keeping it amorphous and, and the small designs and the other part of that is um you know like we're we're in so much of the the landscape uh our mediated landscape is is changing so rapidly that there comes along uh perhaps a you know a simple advance and then it can change everything an example would be uh with i use craft these days simply because it works on uh mobile devices better than the other tools for thought that are out there are more reliably and a benefit of it is that it, it it's kind of like deep search by default so if i just i don't have to turn things into tags or entities i can just uh you know hit uh the the ampersand and start typing and it'll go through any time that i've mentioned that word right so that is, uh, you know, if it, it maybe a stopgap or maybe a total solution to the insight problem, right? If if I know that all I, all I need is some kind of little handle on that insight, and I have a good chance of finding it, and there will I'm sure be more advances in the world of of guessing what the user's intent is, you know, um, that I, I definitely the the formal systems and frameworks that that tend to get really popular um are, are uh, uh i look at those as often like traps and 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 maybe maybe the, the only design that's possible at the time to make a step forward but certainly not where you want to get stuck markdown's a great example of that oh god markdown mark you're up um yeah I, I, sort of I, circling back to this i this idea of you know not wanted to keep things you know not not over formalized to start with i i find myself thinking that and, and again drawing back into the notion of you know if you have vr and be able to have be ridiculously uh, wasteful with this enormous display is um being able to to affect you just push things to the side and I vaguely recall um, Fred talking a while about, you know, about sort of air traffic displays where you just have something at the edge that says, okay, thing here. So it's it's sort of in your peripheral vision, but it's not, but it's it's not in your way. It's not saying you must tick me now. You know, you cannot pass this gate without ticking this thing, saying, okay, there's a thing there. And I I, I like thinking of that sort of peripheral thing in an even more plastic way because, in a sense, you can pull it in towards you or push it away, you know, give it more salience or less salience. Because sometimes, apart from things that need immediate action, it's more that it needs to sit and just ache for a bit, you know, in the side of your mind. Um, because often you're thinking, well, th 
this has this has a point, but I don't know where it goes yet. Maybe it doesn't go at all. Maybe I just let go of it completely. And it was an interesting passing idea or whether it's something No, no, I, you know, I, I can now find where it fits or links to things. So, um, yes, finding ways to have much, much looser capture of things, I think is really interesting because at the moment we're very much in the thrall of very hard edged systems. I don't think I don't think by intent at all. It's just a, it's an unfortunate accident. Um, and I, you know, I keep thinking back to things like spatial hypertext and, you know, large display areas, just, you know, put stuff where it needs to be, you know, play, it, it's basically playing with our sense of associative um, thinking rather than against it. Because I, I yeah. just think, I think we have that plasticity of thought quite naturally. And we don't have particularly large numbers of things that, that actually um, help that. But I think it would be to our benefit if they could. Uh, Brando. Yeah, no, that, that that's really interesting, the, the periphery aspect of it and those reminders. That's something else that I would say about what I do and what I would want more of is uh, ways of being able to retain concrete reminders of the things that are, that I want to be sort of present uh, and ready to hand. Um, so, you know, I, I work with a very messy literal desktop. Uh, I work with a pretty messy figurative desktop insofar as there's a lot of stuff on it. Um, but I also work with a lot of applications still open. I don't close or tidy things up after me, except for the purposes of actual presentation when I'm, when I'm telling people about stuff. I think, um, met the, the head of uh, mergers and acquisitions the other day. That was terrifying and very exciting to know. I think that's, that's the person with the actual money gun. Um, and uh, the uh, the but but the in in doing the sort of the leaving things open for me there there are sort of reminders and crumbs to trip over, and uh, I'd love kind of more of that. Uh, the a computer has only so many pixels, as you say, Mark, and uh, and so being able to have those more pixels to waste um, is cool. And I would love for people to invest, you know, time into thinking about the ways in which those um, those incidental reminders can kind of kick around in the loose forms that they need to be. Um, and yesterday I was over at a friend's house. He had a, he was fidgeting with a Leatherman, you know, the the sort of the pliers, Victorinox uh, pocket knives. And uh, I didn't get around to asking, but it was, it was I, I, still something that I wanted to think about was like, that's a cool thing. What does it make you do? what does its mere presence make you want to do? And I mean, I, I saw he sort of started whittling a, a popsicle stick at one point. Um, but uh, yeah, like, but the, the, the mere presence of these artifacts, uh, as well as the sort of instrumental cap capabilities that they reflexively afford, I think is a, is a really important thing to be able to kind of have. And, you know, the, the number of people who have flipped through a dictionary versus uh, people who have looked up a word uh, on dictionary.com or, or what have you like you don't it doesn't doesn't afford the the sort of the, the wanderings that um that come from those other things and so the the, the notion of action and adjacency uh, uh, from actions and things like that is, is a is a neat thing to be able to do um, the juxtaposition of artifacts that you kind of render in their incidental form also help a lot like if you have a, a sequential diary rather than leaving things on literally random post-it notes and I sort of fall somewhere between the two so yeah I, I think those those are ways that I get stuff down in some places where I want more um, more support in terms of the way that I commit concepts and have the ability to both sort of studiously but incidentally reflect on the artifacts that I've left around the kinds of paper trails that I've created. You talk about tools and environments, I would say, in that, and um, it is very important. Earlier, we saw Peter explaining his new coding environment, and it's easy to say, oh, come on, you know, stop working on the environment and start doing the product. Um, I have that kind of situation too. I have it in the garden. We've now completed another seating area in the garden. I look forward to showing you when you come because I can sit and I can do this and it has this view and it has these attributes and so on. 
So to a certain extent, it can be, of course, uh, just putting things off, but it also can be getting you in the right mindsets. So I know, Brandel, you know, you weren't being entirely dismissive about the Leatherman, but um, it was interesting when we were in Disneyland last week, we did all these amazing things. Edgar's absolute favorite was driving a car on a semi rail so you could stare, but it couldn't go too far. He is always liking the interactive thing, even if it's a playground. You know, Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah, that was great, but I can drive a car now. The, the built-in thing in humanity to use a tool is really, really deep and really, really, um, and really powerfully useful. Now, I'm going to go back to the question earlier of, um, you know, as I've already said, I would like to subscribe to Mark Anderson's reading list because he reads the kind of stuff and he knows more than me in some areas. Similarly, I would like to subscribe to Alan's post-it notes. You know, like that, this specific thing we're talking about now, I would, you know, when we're all gonna die, not in not too far distant future. Some of us will have left something brilliant, you know, and it would be nice for people to go through it. And I'm saying it because Brandel, you're working in a company that has a lot of secrecy. So that's what I'm talking about later on rather than now, right? Sharing. Hi, hi, sorry, they're back. So what I mean is it, it would be a, a technical solution to say we should have dip tech for ideas. Of course, that's ridiculous, right? Because it is very hard edged. But if there was a way where, Brandel, you could, you know, the kind of um, uh, post-it notes messy way if you wanted to have a little pile of those and say you know this is actually kind of useful for this group just throw it over and it becomes accessible for us maybe if we talk full ar you know i have a wall over there which is ideas by you guys you know every once in a while i'll wander over and look at it and some would be good some would be bad whatever but it comes down to the metadata thing again and again if you don't have the infrastructures you can't build the thing on top so is there a way where we can take Alan's idea of blah, let's not even refer to it because then we'll start talking about it. And in a conversation like this, easily note it down. I'm saying this partly because I have my excuse of having had a stroke. That, you know, there's quite a bit of work behind the scenes for the book, as Mark Anderson knows very well because he's done so much of it. Isn't there a more collaborative way of, hey, Fabian's thing was cool. I'm going to write it down. This thing in the book was really cool. I'm going to note it down without it just going in my own personal app or your personal app? I mean, is there is it maybe even a web service where we put it on this web thing, but it can easily go into that other app? Or, or you know, it, first of all, is it rubbish what we're talking about? Or is this a really important question to deal with? Or, or over to Fabian. So to... Uh... One, one little verification and um, <clears throat> first I think when you mentioned uh, the, the tool and sometimes that the, the tricky balance most of us struggle with which is spending time in preparing for the thing versus actually doing the thing so spending so much time improving the tools rather than using them I, I think it's not um, the, the difference to me is uh, empowerment like that's the tool generally bring you more ability to do whatever you were supposed to be doing either right now or in the future. So I think the, the, when you give the example uh, of driving a car as a kid, I think that's a good example because not just of the interactivity, but because normally he doesn't drive a car, at least I hope for you. Uh, and so it brings him in a completely different position of power that usually he's on the uh, back seat and there he's driving. So I think there is a notion not just of interaction, but of doing something literally empowering that was impossible until then. And now that's opening up like huge possibilities, even though it's a little bit fictitious, it's in a sandbox environment, but it's a step of doing like the people in power, so the parents, for example. Uh, so I think, yeah, tools that bring you power, that's super important. And yeah, it's it's really that that to me what makes a difference. The rest is masturbation, which is fun, but you don't really build a lot with it. So I think to go back then to your question of 
uh, is it actually important or I think if we exchange text snippets with each other, yeah, it's a start, but I think if we exchange functions, things that can do stuff like transforming text, then I think it's more powerful and we can do more. The problem is we all have our little different sandboxes, tools, uh, different programming language, different, uh, like the lack of standard in, in PIM or PKM or whatever you want to call it. To me, that's that's a, like the biggest bottleneck for us to exchange, regardless of being VR, non-VR. That's that's where I would see the the core of the. Uh, Alan, I see you, you're next with your hand, but I'm going to ask you as well. Maybe for a thing like this, here's the thought: what Alan had, shouldn't it be Alan's responsibility to write it down in his chosen environment, but make it accessible to us? Uh, uh, agreed. So, um, on the, on the short end of the stick on, the, on uh, what you're talking about is just, uh, in some ways you're talking about simple interop, you know, what, what are the, what functions can be done? Um, and, uh, there's an interesting talk I have with some folks in the hypertext they were talking about like the, the problems that are in PKM are, are the same problems that occur in, in social sphere servers, you know, uh, be it Twitter or uh, Discord or, or Mastodon. Uh, very similar problems. Um, and uh, it's hard to get around, but there's, there's it's still an evolving um, uh, domain. So Zulip is an example of a kind of more evolved Discord it has the advantage, several advantages, one of being able to move a comment that someone makes in one thread over to a more appropriate thread, change the title of the thread, et cetera. And it has a really great feature of also kind of uh, being able to publish to a to a domain by by default, the, the threads that are going on, right? So that's one example of a thing that could, an abstraction layer that could just be so easy to solve, right? Um, and and some some people who use Zulip do that. Now on the other side of it, uh, to what you're saying about yeah, my responsibility even I think that the one thing I've been thinking about this year are uh, you know my own habits. I've been uh, following some habits pretty rigorously this year, which is great. Um, I didn't think I could do that, <laughs> but but one of them is. Um, uh, trying to be more intentional about the review part of of my creation process, and it's funny because in in math, uh, you know, in 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 Polya's uh, how to solve it, the the uh, you have the understanding the problem, you know, coming up with a plan for the problem, solving the problem, and then reviewing it, and that's an essential step. Uh, I personally have been so much more weighted on the capture and creation of new ideas. And just the, when a new idea hits me, that's the first, that's the top priority, right? That's the, maybe the AD, ADHD mentality or whatever. Or it could also be that just the sort of culture that we're in doesn't put enough effort on that, that uh, skill of, hey, you've got enough ideas. Now you have to go back through your week, review them, cultivate them. Um, so I wonder how much of this, how many problems are technological problems and, and versus uh, skills that have just sort of fallen out of favor because they're not as fun. Anyway. Fun is a huge issue. A lot of people who left Doug's team to go to park said it was more fun. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it was like, huh? anyway, uh, but Mark. Yeah, I was just thinking about the interplay between the um, <clears throat> having this sort of um, loose, uh, uh, sort of non-hard-edged um, initial sort of collection of things, um, and the the ability to share, because I, I think there's there's a fair amount of load goes in at the point where you take something that at the moment just sit somewhere in your consciousness you're quite happy that it is it is where it is and it is not something else but it is within your ken um the difference between that and having something i can share with some somebody else that they can 
used in a tractable way without me having to explain what it is. Um, and there's an interesting dilemma there then that comes about between the fact that if I want to share it, then I have to I have to do some degree of formalism. Um, but we at the same time might be wanting to, to hold off on premature formalism because that might crush the very idea that we're looking at. And so I, 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 I don't know the answer there, but I think there's a really interesting sort of dynamic at play there. Yeah, one of the things that I think both uh, Chris Crawford and uh, Ernest Adams, the folks who are responsible, uh, like uh, on both uh, game designers, very uh, early game designers and, and excellent authors on the subject of game design, they talk about issuing, um, you know, written texts of any of any volume until large aspects of the sort of the game mechanics are worked out. I'm also conscious that that comes from a position where one games it's arguable are worse simpler at the time and two with a certain amount of interior structure implicit in their ability to conceive of what a game is then they were able to keep more in their heads about what a game would be for a longer period of time and let it sort of percolate but i think that the 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 the, the benefit still persists when you have the ability to keep those things around um when I, it was interesting you're saying about formalizing and what i was saying about simplifying and the fact that i tidy up my desktop when I show somebody something. Um, one of the things that uh, writing things down per se um, is useful for Froda is stripping away all of the bits that you don't need for the benefit of being able to show the things that people should have. And uh, to the extent that somebody sort of writes about a concept, you know, having having a, a one pager or, or a couple of illustrations, things that can kind of communicate something versus being able, having to, to know to look at a specific time code in a video on YouTube. Uh, those, those are worlds apart in terms of the sort of the context that people need to have in order to be able to understand them. And to the extent that writing is useful or, or um, anything like that, I, I think uh, those um, simpler artifacts are useful. So, you know, what Omar Rizwan does a lot of is is short tweets about things. It seems like it's been pretty popular for people to do pretty simple green mockups of um, kind of provocations and interventions on standard modes of the way that especially iOS works. I think because of the, the increasingly universal legibility of mobile phones as, as a mode and the way in which we secretly harbor our own sort of dissatisfactions with them. Uh, it means that if you can provide a, a representation of something that is heterodox, then it's immediately recognizable as kind of relatable and um, and uh, sort of heretical. And I, I think that's that's really interesting. Um, but yeah, like by I, I I haven't done a lot of I haven't done any writing for you. My apologies. But uh, but what I have done is made you know short videos uh, and and uh, individual screenshots, and hopefully those have so serve some uh, function in terms of being able to kind of strip away some of the, the context context and support material that that I uh, put into them in order to make sure that they're kind of individually understandable for 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 what they what for what people actually need um, and then can kind of play with and run with themselves. Thank you. That that was useful. Um, so Alan's run away. <laughs> it's funny. So how about uh, I propose the simplest and most obvious thing I just wrote in chat, hypercard. Thinking about it a little bit because hypertalk uses the kind of uh, graphic language of the uh, of the 90s. So imagine just uh, I like to talk in product terms. So please forgive me. Imagine we have a website called whatever. Call it hypercard. Steal the name. right? And on there you log in and all you can do is write little cards which have special things just like the original hypercards but the key is that they can be you also have a local app so if you want to have it constantly downloaded to your old computer and served as pdfs or whatever you want database that's entirely up to you fine so you don't feel that it's going to go away but the idea is imagine the meeting today i said alan that's really cool have you written that down down and he says no i haven't and i say well go to hypercard and write it down damn it he writes it down, just a sentence or two, but once that is on the hyperwebs, I can now cite him. 
because he he's marked it as public. And that's the entire thing. Because so often neat things, especially in academia, if you can't cite it, it doesn't exist. Right, and to be able to do all kinds of metadata hidden on the other side of the card, that's not really a problem for us techies. But to make some kind of a system where we can easily interchange will be just, it's like the web, but the web reduced to Twitter size. The thing that I would love to see or need to see with that, and I think this is a, 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 a that's a great point and, and I want to live in a world where that's possible. I also want to live in a world where we have broken away from our, um, we seem to confuse, we, we put too much primacy on the idea of publication and uh, finished products, which makes sense because we come from this print world paradigm. Um, what would be far more useful with that sort of hypercard uh, analogy is, you know, yeah, I go put it down. I put down this, you know, thing that says uh, checkboxes are are an illusion, whatever. Now you can reference that, but then I can go back and add a stack to it, evolve it, right? And it doesn't break the link, right? But it's now understood that, and this is it would almost have to be a cultural shift, right? Uh, you would have to be comfortable with the idea of pointing to my blob globule, uh, my, my loose, uh, fluid, evolving idea space, right? And ra rather than the one comment, right? And I, and I would have to be uh, comfortable with saying, uh, this is something that I'm still kind of tinkering with and working on. And sure, you connected to that version, but I want others to see this version, right? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's absolutely Perfect. I think it would have to be a system whereby once you have made something public, you then have options to, of course, you can delete it. And, that, you know, like anything can be deleted, but I will have my own local copy. Ha, ha, ha. Right. So you can then you can choose to disavow it. You can say, you know, no, but that would have to be another card. Remember, Doug Engelbart's journal was based on the simplest versioning possible. You put in a thing. And when you put in the same thing again, it becomes version two, and they are aware of each other. That's it. So for you to have a stack of cards that relates to it is perfect. Right? Um, but once you made yeah. it public, like a tweet or a Facebook thing, you cannot guarantee that you can then delete it. You can to an extent, but you know that, that's secondary. I like it. Uh, Fabian, what are your thoughts on this? The reason I'm asking particularly is, let's say magically we built such a thing. In your environment, would you want to be able to display and interact with such things? Because obviously there would be some way to see at least some of them being connected. Like I will write a thing, and if I refer to Alan's bit, you know, that that would be known. It wouldn't necessarily be a backlink. Certainly, you know, you have a whole world and that would be great, but at least these units would be addressable. Sure. <laughs> like anytime I can plug in information and link back or source back and keep track of version, I always find that useful. Randall, you got your hand up too. I do. Um, so one of the challenges that I find with the idea of publication is that, uh, for example, most actually, most platforms, but especially Twitter. So what you're describing sounds a lot like, um, uh, it's not identical to, but a lot like a specific usage of Twitter and something that perhaps uh, some people do more than others in terms of showing half-baked things or or interesting provocations and concepts. Um, that is not how I use Twitter, and one of the reasons why I do that is because I like I I, I use it for self-promotion. You know, I I show things that I think are interesting and impressive, that hopefully tread the line between show, demonstrating that some concepts are um, achievable for people to be able to relate to, but that I'm good at it and possibly better than them. 
Um, and that's that's a that's a carefully cultivated thing. And so um, there are a lot of ways that I could use Twitter and a lot of ways which I'm tempted to. But ultimately, I I want to have an audience and and, and a, an ability to relate to people and, and, and have that thing be out there for maybe pretty selfish reasons. But having a having a network or a social network um, of various kinds sort of ultimately results in having different kind of personas um, and um, you would need a community or a, a modality to be separated enough, separable um, in order for me to be able to participate with showing my thoughts and, and ideas, it, quite aside, aside from any kind of, uh, you know, corporate secrecy thing, um, in order for it to be possible for me to be able to share in that way. And uh, yeah, that's slightly at odds with the idea of, of onlineness and sharing and, and uh, portability of those things. And, uh, um, you know, and, and it strikes to the core of the way that like, that, like network maximalists, people like Mark Zuckerberg who believe that connections are good are uh, misunderstanding the fact that we have boundaries and barriers in the way that we present in different arenas and venues for a pretty good reason. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it seems like what we're talking about is the term microblogging, which of course has morphed into all kinds of things. And of course, it's very Twitter related. It's just, you know, sorry, getting away from a server that is owned by one company properly, you know, maybe it could be built on Mastodon. The idea is just, you know, when I started my PhD, and I think every PhD student goes through this, what is everyone else doing in the department? Shouldn't they be at least blogging about what they're doing? It just doesn't happen. Right. So the whole setting down to share some knowledge is real time and real effort. And you want to wait until you have a publication to do that. But if you have the means of, you know, you, you get a little insight, you save it for yourself and you can choose to make it public or not. You know, the, the thing is, if it can be made lightweight enough and findable enough and browsable enough, you know, like it could also auto tweet at the same time. Of course it could and, or put it on Mastodon, but you know, where else should Alan put down his thing about this checkbox? It's such a good case study. Is he forced to write a blog post about it now? Is it only going to be in here? Is it going to be in the book? I see three hands. Alan, you're first, or was that a, a legacy hand? That was a legacy hand. Okay. Uh, Mark, and then probably and then. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, actually, fun enough. Uh, um, Randall actually sort of slightly touched on where I was going, but coming to it from a slightly different angle, which is more related to uh, perhaps to privacy. But I was thinking, I was reflecting on um, Alan's point about that we don't, maybe we need to have a sort of shift in the way we look at these things. And I, I was wondering how we deal with with the divide between the often more transactional and decidedly harder edged um, nature of things like work you know where we don't where we don't have the freedom to just go color outside the lines uh against this more freewheeling interchange where um the fewer barriers there are to what you can sort of stick and care less to something else the better um and I, uh, I, I it's interesting i don't know i don't know how you you put those two whether you put them Se completely separate or whether you allow them to slightly mix my, my feeling is that if you allow them to mix too closely that the well what 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 the current world will tell you is the formal part will take over because that sort of seems to be somehow makes things more tractable um but of course what it does it pushes the more loose associative stuff even further out of reach um yeah and 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 an interesting thought reflecting on sort of people talk about uh, Twitter and microblogging. For years, I, I read um, Twitter through uh, Tweetbot because I just didn't want to read it in a browser, and I and I and I didn't like their own app, which which Twitter's own app. Um, and so when all the third party apps got massacred a while back, um, I stopped reading Twitter. And actually, I'm not sure I've. I don't feel I've missed much. I'm still getting information elsewhere. What what I am doing is reading more. So I'm doing less scrolling and trying to find the good bits amongst the oversupply of information. Not, not through anybody's fault, but simply because the, the way the aggregation works is you get too much. Um, and so I'm, 
I'm sort of actually reading more in a considered sense and making more of an effort to try to find ways to uh, find other access to sort of previous good sources of information that I, I, I otherwise got through Twitter, um, which hasn't made me rush to want to rush off and do Mastodon. I mean, I think what it's reminded me is I don't really like social networks. And <laughs> if I could not have them in my life, I think I'd be much happier. There are other ways to communicate, uh, but, but I mean that's not a one size fits all at all. So I wouldn't want I wouldn't want that comment to be mistaken as I think that's what we should all be doing. But I thought it was uh, it, because Twitter happened to be mentioned. I thought I just threw that observation in, uh, uh, Fabian. I, I briefly looked for the link, but can't find it back. Uh, but there is um, from the D Web, the decentralized web group who set of people, there is a technique uh, or process, I think, called uh, publish home and share outside or something like this. And another way, which is like publish on a platform, share elsewhere. There is two abbreviations, but tip of my tongue, can't remember them. Um, so so there, are all, there are different ways to, to really address this. It's like, do we rely on Twitter and back up on Mastodon or at somewhere else? Or, or do we distrust every platform because we know that at some point they're going to go down? And then we always have a home, a digital home where we publish there first and then put either the whole thing or traces of it, meaning the title, the title plus whatever, metadata or summary. Uh, and then we get a URL that other might see or not using RSS, using custom client, using whatever, and possibly federated like Mastodon. So that's, I, I don't think that's actually a, a hard problem. Uh, it's more like, do we, do we use the uh, social network tool as they were supposed to, uh, or do we just let's say hijack the infrastructure uh, to use them however we want to use them as? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm still yeah, figuring it out. But technically speaking, I would tend by default to rely on Mastodon because then it means being able to interconnect safely and, and not losing anything. And yeah, it's a tiny bit of maybe more work at the beginning, but I think it's safe. Sorry, I couldn't unmuting, unmute while sharing screen. I mean, blogs exist. Blogs are simple. So I just noted this down as kind of an example thing. Uh, author can export to WordPress. It's just very often there's some kind of breakage and it's quite expensive for me to keep up uh, or HTML. Um, yeah, you see, here, here is the thing, how to store and find a thought. That's what I'm looking at in the journal. But, you know, if we have a really easy interface to write a tiny thing like this, or is it a matter of reinventing blogging, but cleanly and simply? Because it, it, for the sake of this discussion, would it have been too much to ask if Alan had a blog type thing set up for him to write his thing this brief? Not for us to uh, but I did. I put it in the chat, by the way, a while ago. The, 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 fact that we're not, the fact that we're not aware of it, that, for example, Alan put it in the chat, is <laughs> what opens um, those social networks from the blogging platforms. We can register via RSS, but it doesn't like notify um, either of people. We can't easily aggregate. We need to know that the blogs exist. So I think that's that's publishing it online is one thing. Others being uh, aware of it. Others being either human being or clients or network to spread. That, that's the difference. Uh, Where did you write it in the chat? Uh, it, it's. Uh, I don't see it. I don't see it either. It's probably a ways. I'm sure that I did. Let me see. Right with the guardrail, the there it is. Not complete, but so is uh, at minute uh, eleven forty between eleven forty two and eleven forty seven. 
Uh, can you read it to us? Because the times is different for us. Oh, right. Okay, I'll just post it again. How about that? Yeah, it's a link. Uh, it's not it's, it's not a write up in the chat. It's the one. I should have clarified that. Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't yeah, see, I see that. it now. So uh, on that note, I mean, um, what I have been doing up until I had a death in the family last week, oh, uh, which is not a thing to laugh I'm about, but to hear that. Oh, uh, no, it's, I appreciate it. Um, is uh, I've and I'm going to get back onto it, but I was uh, publishing every day, um, and and the fun part about it is that I and maybe this applies, but to take the pressure off of me of publishing a post, um, I actually just have a repo and I add an, a new issue uh, to it every day. Some of them I hit, I add the tag publish to it or not. So um, for instance, uh, at least for a good streak daily, I was putting things in there, even if I just had time to, to add just a, a list of, you know, what I've been reading today. Right. And it's more of a, a habit change to say like, okay, here's, I'm going to challenge myself to at least take something out of note form, throw it in there in GitHub. Then I can improve on it as I want. If I hit, if I add the tag publish, then I know that it will show up on my site. Um, so, so it's a, it's a habit change, right. But that's, that's kind of something I'm tinkering with. I think this is phenomenally great and useful to see. I've gone to the homepage to look at your latest posts. And because it is a real thing and it's a proper use of blogs, the, the question then becomes, how can I mark what I give a shit about? And how can I mark inside why I care? So you have uh, like machine learning needs designers, right? Yes. Well, uh, I haven't set this part up, but it's actually... Um all I have to do is uncomment some code and you could leave a comment that would not only show up on the blog, but it would show up as a comment in the issue in the GitHub repo, which is what I really love about it because the GitHub has a long track record of being, you know, kind of like, uh, oh. yeah, yeah. There's also, that's really interesting because obviously we have such a thing as pingbacks, right? So if I write in my own blog a comment, then you would see that, which is really, really nice. But um, uh, my brain just short circuited there. I'm sorry, I interrupted you and I short circuited. Um, this is really cool that you're doing this, Alan. One challenge I would have doing this myself is that I, my stream of consciousness, this is, this is, not unlike what I, what what occurs in my notes app, um, but I wouldn't share that with anybody because it's really petty, what I say in there, uh, and and I and I afford myself that uh, that um, in order to be able to get it out of my system. Um, but so that it, you know, there's a, there's a lot of my just saying like I'm feeling lost. What do I think about what what why am I doing this? Uh, and restatement of those basic questions, but it's anchoring nevertheless to have have the ability to get those down on paper and to, to try to answer those questions time and time again. Um, I remember, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah sorry, you guys. So we have a, a thing that I worked with Christopher Gutteridge based on Hyperwords where you can do high resolution copying from, uh, citing from a blog, right? And it's a little here or there, but such a thing as being able to look at your blog here, Alan, and then something that strikes me as being useful, select it, copy it, paste it in my own work, should obviously cite this properly. That in itself would go a long way because then I put it into my own notes. And when I look through my notes, oh, this is brilliant. Oh no, it's actually Alan's thoughts, but whatever, there's a link, I go find it in your stuff. So just mm -hmm. being able to address things, it's just so perfect. One, um, yeah, agreed. And there are some plugins that, that come close to that in some ways. Uh, a plugin that I use pretty often when I'm on the web 
on a desktop is the readwise plugin so i just have to hit a button and it'll it'll suck up the uh the article or whatever and then i can highlight it or or uh uh make comments to it knowing that it'll be captured within readwise yeah just um hang on yeah obviously i, I hang on i have thoughts on this but so here i am copied I go to uh, author, paste it. There isn't that much that needs to be pasted. Maybe, you know, have a little quote thing. Uh, because I think maybe, is that here? No. Can't remember where we have this plugin running now. But in principle, guys, doesn't that make a lot of sense that the uh, the act of citing can solve a lot of this, provided Alan blogs, it's useful to us, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's useful, and it becomes a a, a tricky last mile problem pretty quickly um so i really one thing i really like about the whatever tft community space it is is that you know they're they're uh, trying to chip away at it so the advantage of something like pushing things to readwise is that they have an excellent api system with a, with an excellent citation like you're talking about built in so then I can push it from Readwise to LogSeq to whatever tool of the week there is. And uh, if I settle on one, then you know, I can become my home. Um, and it, so it's encouraging. And I think uh, Fabian's right. It's like, these are not difficult problems. They're just last mile problems because everybody has their own flows. And so it's like, the, it's so that also makes it a boring problem, right? Yeah. Anyway, uh, it, it's well, it, it's an important problem, like the checkbox. Hmm. One of the real pleasures of a last mile problem. Sorry, Mark. I'll say this real quick and then pass it on. It's six. The real, the real breakthrough for me. Oh, and I gotta go. Uh, uh, the the real pleasure of this setup of using GitHub issues is one of the main hurdles for me to publish online is uh needing to the confidence of a not well, personal confidence but the confidence in the system right um and and with issues because the github app on mobile and on ios on, on ipad is, is so fantastic i know that even if i'm out uh i can open up a new issue publish it it will immediately push to the site and i know this is like hey have you tried wordpress but um the advantage then over over WordPress is I don't have to worry about where that data goes. It's 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 it starts out as transparent and public and and on a repo. Anyway, uh, that that's been nice. That that's that problem. That small part of the problem is solved. Ironically, it also had uh, uh, Twitter embeds up until Musk shut that down. So. So I, I so actually carrying on from that because one one thing I was thinking is you know as good as it is to capture some sort of a permalink or something, um, actually capturing as much you know maybe who or you know who and why because actually permalinks aren't that permanent. And I think of the thirty years or something I've used the web and how much of it is actually left and the, and and fun of even the long running things about every sort of five years will say oh we decided to use this new thing and who knew all the permalinks had broken well never mind we'll just carry on with the new thing uh, and, and i get that because you you know there just isn't time often to go back but i but it is a reminder that um whilst it is a good thing to link and I, you know I, so I, I i absolutely don't argue against doing it um it's insufficient unfortunately um you know the good thing was the the web was built to 
be resilient to this sort of failure. So it doesn't all break when a bit winks out. Um, but there is a danger in placing too much reliance on that because if if all you've got is is all you've got to go back to is a link that's now broken, um, you've lost a lot more than perhaps you needed to. Well, well, this is why it's so important to take it with you as well, the whole thing, absolutely. Um, I mean, one thing that would be really, really useful, though, is um, just briefly share the screen and then go back to, to Randall there. So if I copy this now, and then I go to uh, author, and I can do this thing. I can do a command T for citation and use Safari copy, because then it'll go online and find all this. All it's missing is Alan's name. So if in Safari um, header, the author name was there, boom, see original text is there. So, you know, there, there are ways to take it with us as it were. Uh, sorry, uh, Brandon, please go ahead. Um, um, I'm still hung up on, I know that you, you like to find text narrowly uh, as as sort of written glyphs uh, on a page that have been sort of intentionally arranged. But I, I think of writing as the explicit invocation of a durable artifact that can be kind of consulted and referred to and looked back at. And, you know, one of the things that I'm conscious of that I think it would be actually pretty interesting to play with is um, what's improvable about the transcript of this, you know, this is a YouTube, this, this is a conversation in real life, but it'll be a, a YouTube video in fairly short order. And as we've kind of played with a little bit, there's a, there's a transcript that comes out of that. Um, and that's those, both those artifacts are referable back to in some measure. Uh, one challenge is that they're not very good. You know, they don't, they don't lend themselves to being able to kind of be perused and, and understood as documents of record that have any particular import or or priority or hierarchy, and what you uh, pay money for for the for the um, uh, this especially the presentations is for somebody to go and and render those at least at a level where there's attributable speech and things. Um, I uh, a couple of ways to take it. One is that um, you know it seems it seems almost inevitable that. Uh, YouTube could do better, that the systems that are responsible for speech should also be able to be responsible for attributing it, not specific speakers, knowing that I'm Brandel and that Alan's Alan. But Alan also has to go. Do you need to, so do you want to say, step out or are you, are you you're all right? Oh, uh, um, um, all right. Yes, I do need to go. I didn't realize I was muted. Um, thank you. I'm sure it'll be great. I'll check out the video. It's great to see everybody. Adios. <laughs> awesome, Alan. I just, Hi, I Alan. just, I'm just probably you're waiting for that. Um, not to kick him out. Um, where am I? Uh, yeah. So, like the YouTube videos could be better. It could be uh, able to uh, identify people, uh, or if not that that I'm me and you're you, but then at least I'm one person and you're another person. Uh, it should it should be, have some ability to be able to kind of distinguish and, and order it seems to do some job of that. Um, but also like the the like for one of a better way of putting it, like the, the the changes in tack of a conversation, it should be possible to be able to kind of assess uh, the way in which it could be you know possible to to put landmarks re references to the fact that there is a major change in. Um, either tone or velocity or um, or uh, vocabulary within a specific place such that it would be able to render uh, re re render a, a, a document that pertains to the content of a conversation a little bit more glanceable. Um, makes me want to know if I know anybody at YouTube I could ask these things because it would be really great for people to do it. You know, I know people on Apple, but they don't, we don't, we don't have a YouTube. We have, um, we've got, photos, but we don't have a particular sort of pedigree or history of people committing talking heads style videos to photos for the benefit of being able to make use of it as a corpus. But I'm going to, I'm going to pursue it because I think that, um, you know, what you're asking for, for could, 
it's just being fixed by YouTube because they're there, especially during the pandemic. But even now, I mean, not the pandemic was not got, not over, but people aren't cooped up in their houses uh, to some, quite the same extent. Like, um, there should be quite a body of stuff to be able to, to look over to think about, like, what thoughtfully can we create um, that term like serves as a, as a way of being able to consult this as a document rather than simply holding this byte stream of pixels of floating heads kind of wobbling around and talking to each other over time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would prefer that to doing any writing. <laughs> I guess I'm just that lazy. Yeah, sounds good to me. Uh, we do need to wrap up, but Peter, please go ahead. Yeah, I think that when we're creating permalinks, we really should be permalinking to a hash of the actual content so that if it exists somewhere else, it might not even exist for a period of time, but not get reintroduced into the internet. And as long as the link is to hash on what the substantive text is extracted from any kind of formatting or stuff around it, that's probably the most durable way to go. But also, I really care about having fine-grained control over presentation and doing fancy typographical things I can do in a typesetting language that I can't do elsewhere. So maybe what we could have is copying onto the clipboard the plain text, the link uh, to the hash of the plain text, and also a compact representation of the typesetting code itself and a hash on that. And that way you'd be able to have basically, instead of passing around a PDF of the final rendered output, you could be passing around the text telling the rendering system how to create that output. And that would be a lot more amenable to extracting content from and doing data scraping and things than a final generated PDF document. Because I think you're losing a lot of the typesetting information at a high level when you reach the PDF level. So I might have a nice high level abstraction it's represented in my LaTeX code, but when it turns into a PDF, it's just, you know, move to such and such coordinates on screen, offset so many dimensions, and then write this block of text. But we've lost the semantics attached to that block of text that were preserved at the typesetting level. So I think maybe what we should be doing is go for the typesetting version, then you can automatically generate the PDF for actually looking at it. That's not so much of an issue, but if our systems could move around instructions for typesetting as well as raw content and keep those nicely factored out from one another. So I could just be interested in the content of Alan's database of postings, or I could be interested in how Fabian chose to represent visually a nicely pre-printed formatted block of source code where he did some enhancements with fine grain layout which would otherwise have been lost. And then we can get to both facets of it. And that's my final thought for the day. And have a great week, everybody. And we'll see you next time. It was bad. I was getting into withdrawal from not having had it last week. So it's good to see everybody again. And Frode, I hope you're not having any side effects from the stroke thing and that you and your family are all doing really well. And that goes for everybody else. Hope everyone's yeah, in good you. health. Stay safe. Thank you. We had uh, we had a lovely, relaxing time in in France, so that helped. Um, before we log off, just reading what Randall wrote here. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I mean, that, to, to your point, Peter, like um, the, the 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 separation between syntax and presentation is is what CSS is for. Uh, it, it, there's a there's a funny sort of debasement that we have of a lot of web technologies where if we think if it's on the web then it must be worthless, uh, but in fact CSS is is an incredibly um, well thought out system whereby you have the ability to present things and retain retain the semantic or the, the syntactic structure and 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 have that reflect the semantics of of what the meaning of all of those different pieces are. So if you if you uh, modify the, if you uh, go into uh, for example a page on apple.com and you delete all of the CSS files, then what you result what you get is something that looks a lot like Wikipedia, frankly, uh, in terms of the of of all of the the headers and subheaders on a page uh, reflecting the actual informational content. Well, here, here's a, a real a, crazy a uh, Do you know if anyone's anyway. ever tried to do a translator to convert LaTeX source 
the CSS and vice versa, although you'd probably be losing some semantics if you tried to reverse the transformation. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. And it, I, it's, I it's a shame in a way that a lot of the people surrounding sort of Lake Etik and PDF seem to actually be remarkably anti-progress. You know, they delight in the fact that, that LaTeX and PDF stuff, you know, has difficult things like ligatures, which look lovely on screen, but in other senses aren't, aren't well tractable. And it's a real shame, really. But I mean, in a way, I mean, LaTeX is, is kind of weird, too, because it doesn't seem to be under, a, I mean, it's having stuff added to it and it's being used a lot, but I'm not clear that it's actually being developed really still. Well, all the actions basically move to the add-on packages now. But, you know, you can find computational linguistics packages and biochemistry notation packages and trying to replicate all of those in the CSS environment yep. would be an incredibly time consuming nightmare. And it would be nice if there was some way to just automatically leverage all that existing work, but then bring it over to the newer notation system being used by the web. Sounds like it needs doing, and lucky, luckily enough, I'm not nearly clever enough to do that, so I won't stick my hand up. <laughs> On that bombshell, look forward to seeing you guys in a week, hopefully. Yep. Uh, it's Take an care. interesting, uh, okay, bye. interesting Take care. discussion. Much appreciated. Bye.